Hey everyone, Tech Rally here, and today I'm with uh, three special guests, and we're going to be reviewing the Flatiron School. And I get a lot of questions asked to me about, hey, should I attend a coding boot camp? Should I attend Flatiron School? Should I attend App Academy? Any coding boot camp? And as much as I would love to be able to answer these types of questions, I haven't been to a coding boot camp for about six years now. So a lot of times the curriculum does change. I didn't even learn React when I went to a coding boot camp. So it's really good to have people that went to a coding boot camp recently and kind of understands the curriculum and whatnot. So super glad to have these three guests. And thank you so much for coming on. Um, first of all, thank you, Christian. Thank you, EJ. And thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. <laughs> cool. Of course. And uh Christian, do you just want to give a quick intro about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I attended Flatiron in uh, 2019 in mm -hmm. the on-campus full-time web development program. Uh, yeah, graduated around October 2019, and then I've been working uh, I'm in my second software development job. Um, now I work as more of a back-end Python developer at a trading firm in Chicago. Got it, got it. And yeah, sorry, I forgot to give the format, but EJ, if you can just say uh, when you attended uh, the coding boot camp, what did you actually, what course did you take? And if you're working as a software engineer now, so yeah. that would be the format we're going to follow. Yeah. All right, it's good. Uh, I went to Flatiron in, from July 2020 to December 2020, when apparently the rest of the world did. Uh, I did the uh, online uh, the software engineering course, and I am working as a software a junior software engineer at a company uh, relatively local to me for the last month or so. Cool. And this is your first position. Yes, this is my first uh, software engineering job. Got it. Cool. Alex, I know we've talked a few times, but <laughs> tell the world yeah. who are you? <laughs> what um, do you do? My name's Alexandria, but please call me Alex. Um, I attended Flatiron uh, 2019, graduated December 6th. Don't ask me why I remember that. <laughs> and I got a job right out of the bat. So I'm actually on my third job now. And I work at Ticketmaster as a software engineer three, which is like a step below a senior, if you don't know what that means. Software so. engineer three. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. cool. That's cool. So all of you are currently working as software engineers after graduating from fire and school. Yes. Yep. Cool. And uh, how long did it take again? Just to, like if we had to put it down to months, like for you, Christian, it was uh, two months, three months? One month. One yeah. month. And then EJ for you, it uh, was... Well, I graduated the week before Christmas in 2020 and mm -hmm. I started September 1st. So Okay. So a number nine, of months. Number of months. Cool. Yes. And then Alex, uh, yours was just like right away, you said, right? Yeah, mine was also a month. But this cool. is pre-COVID, so it's a little different Got I think, it. for people now. Yeah, yeah. same, yeah. same pre-COVID. So EJ, you're the only one that had that had done the course online then? Yeah, uh, apparently, yes. Oh, the, 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 cool. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, how much did uh, Flatiron School cost? And maybe we could just kind of go from left to right. Christian first. God, too much. Um, I did, <laughs> I'm sure Alex will agree with me. Um, I did the ISA. So I think I, well, I'll be paying $19,500. That'll be done by like in a few months, I think. Like five months, I'll have paid it off. So that'd be great. <laughs> Got it. Well, yeah, we could talk more about that later. Sure. Yeah. What about you, EJ? Uh, I think after the deposit, it was fourteen five. Mm -hmm. but uh, I got my job three weeks after the money back guarantee hit. So I just got all of my debt cleared out. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it just works out. Yeah. <laughs> it's by design. What about you, Alex? Um, if I had not done the ISA, it would have been $12,500, <laughs> but because of the way that the ISA works, when I'm done paying it, I will have paid $18,750. And no, Holy. it was not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I made a few videos on my YouTube channel myself about the dangers of an ISA, especially if you live in a very expensive city, like probably Christian. <laughs> but we could definitely elaborate on that later. But uh, what were you all doing before... Um, attending Flatiron School? Um, for me, for I was, I had just kind of like burnt out of being a trader. Uh, so I was like day trading for a company for a couple years. Um, 
and I had like just quit my job and I was like, well, shit, what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And why coding though? Um, I was always kind of interested in it, like growing up, like messing around with like making like little games and things here and there. And, um, if I didn't study finance in college, I uh, went to Indiana, by the way, uh, if I didn't study that, I definitely would have done computer science, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was kind of like, just like a natural thing to kind of fall into. What about you, EJ? Uh, I was in security for about four or five years thereabout. Uh, and like Christian said, just burnt out hit the extraordinarily low ceiling of the place I was at mm -hmm. and just needed a bit more. I got into tech because uh, some friends of mine are in and were pretty much convinced me to do the boot camp thing. I did flat iron because a friend of mine had done flat iron and just recommended it. Got it. Got it. And you, Alex? Um, Kind of a lot. So I had been an executive admin for like almost 10 years quit so I could have my daughter and was taking care of her. And I think she was six or seven months old and I was like losing my mind. I really wanted to work and I couldn't kind of like couldn't find a job. I wanted to go back to executive admin work, but also didn't want to go into an office for like eight hours a day, you know, and my boyfriend, uh, I had actually gone to a Flatiron project showcase with him as a first date. And he basically <laughs> was just like, you know, you should do this because you're good at programming. You've done it before. Like you did it growing up. Like, what do you have to lose? You're already at home anyways. Like worst case scenario, you just don't enjoy it. And then you do something else. And so I applied, I like did all this stuff. Um, and it's kind of just been like <laughs> taking off ever since then. It's been really wild. So, yeah. yeah that's awesome. What an interesting first date to choose. Yeah. Maybe he already... <laughs> was he a fan of Flatiron School or something? Yeah, he was going to go. And he's like, well, I'm going to go. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, oh, my God, I love programming. Like, I'd love to go, too. Huh. And um, he never ended up going. <laughs> that's so intriguing. Yeah. Interesting. How, how hard was it to get into Flatiron School? Like for me, when I did in 2015, I had to do like a tic-tac-toe and then I had to like study some books and then I had to interview with the dean and the co-founder, I guess, and they let me in. But oh, um, what, what was it like for y'all? Um, I reached out. I did the application bit. I talked to, I don't remember who I talked to, some guy. He's an admissions guy, I guess. And he was like, here, do the pre-course. And then... I'll reach out again. I did like half the pre-course. I got through the JavaScript part and started doing the Ruby. And he's like, yeah, that's good enough. Welcome to Flatiron. Your credit cleared. <laughs> yeah, I think mine was something it's pretty much similar to that. Like they definitely, when I was talking to the people like recruiting wise, they were like, oh, we, we only accept like 10% of that. Yeah, I got like, that one too. That's a, uh, maybe we could say that for later, but that, that's a whole other thing, I think. Um, but yeah, I actually know where they get that stat from. Um, and it's just the amount of people that apply but never finish the pre-work. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. But yeah, yeah, I had similar experience. It was basically just like, oh, you want to do this? Like, let's chat for 10 minutes. Okay, cool. You seem really nice. Now go finish the pre-work. And then I like did 5% of the pre-work and they were oh, like, yeah. okay, cool. You're accepted. I was like, okay, cool. Pretty thanks. Much. So would you say the barrier to entry or just getting into a cohort is fairly easy on the easier side? I would say the barrier to entry is if, if they think you can pay for it, mm -hmm. that you get a hoodie. <laughs> yeah. I would say the only barrier is you. Like if you're not yeah, going to put in much. the time to complete the pre-work and if you're not going to actually like follow up with them, that's like the only barrier. Or if you decide like if you do the pre-work and you're like, no, actually, I really hate doing this. I mean, that's yeah. totally valid too. But I think a lot of times people are just really lazy about it and then they don't get in immediately or they get scared away with the fact that it's like 120 hours of pre-work mm -hmm. and they just don't do any of it. And you don't have to do all 120 hours. You just have to do a little bit. So 
how, how does that actually work? So you do a little bit of the pre-work and then do you just email them saying, hey, I did it? Or do they look at something or I, what's I what's guess the they just see how far you made it in the track. Yeah, oh, because they're like a logged in to yeah, something, right? Yeah, because you do, for me, I did the free part and then it asked me to apply after I did it. And the free part was just literally HTML and CSS. And I did that over a weekend and talked to him and he was like, all right, apply congratulations you're in and then i just kept going through the pre-work after that uh, for me personally it was a little different i had like a scheduled interview like a coding interview that i had to do so i just did as much pre-work like up to the tic-tac-toe which is not all of the pre-work and then i just had to do the tic-tac-toe for the interview so i think it was about 20 hours of work and also their pre-work is incredibly difficult because they throw you zero bones <laughs> and you haven't gotten good at, at like googling yet so you're just sitting there like what is going on <laughs> oh yeah so i didn't i didn't even have a coding interview they just i talked to the really? guy oh yeah i talked to the guy and he was just like you seem great you did this you, you got this far in the the pre-work here you go Oh, yeah, oh, wow. same. They okay. had like a, also, they, they I'm sarcastic, it. so if it sounds like I'm shit talking, I you'll know. But I generally am not trying to. <laughs> the secret is he's always shit talking. I'm just funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's no, my no, secret. It's, that's my secret cap. This is this is the secret sauce to this uh yeah. three way interview right here. <laughs> yeah. In Chicago, but was there remember, any? Re- oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say like I remember in Chicago also like when I started, I did also didn't do the have to do a coding interview. They had like instead it was like a. Uh, saturday like retreat day i think where you actually went to the school and then you did like it was like six hours and they just like had a couple courses and if you like sat through that they were like that basically counted as your coding interview but like you didn't have to do anything i love i love how the four of us is just like the slight the steady decline in, <laughs> in, in, in admission uh process yeah i definitely didn't get six hours of anything yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like it's very different, maybe even depending on cities, right? Because uh, Christian, you're in Chicago, and that was an in-person one. Mm-hmm. And then EJ, you did yours I just online. did online. That might, that, that might be the difference. That could be a little two. bit different, yeah. I also so, did mine in Atlanta, which no longer exists. So right, right. I didn't play anything. So. <laughs> so outside of like the potential red flags of maybe uh, like being able to just get in really easily or not, um, were you guys considering other coding bootcamp schools? I was not. I didn't really know any other ones. Mm-hmm. Um, I did. I did like a lot of actually extensive like boot camp research because um, from the jump, I think like I was pretty skeptical of boot camps, and I was like weighing my options like, oh, okay, should I go get try to get a master's or like do a boot camp? And reading like a ton of reviews, and I know like I was considering like um, I think coding Code Dojo was one in like general assembly um and like app academy but i think like app academy might only be on like california or something like that um, um and isn't yeah. general no i'm thinking of another one there's like tesla or something like that that's just in colorado yeah and i like something looked like at the turing yeah turing oh right right i looked at the curriculums too and i was like some of these curriculums were like i was like this is just like really unrealistic because i think like coding dojo had like oh you learned three different stacks in like right three months and i'm like what <laughs> yeah i saw their curriculum a while back and i think you learn rails and then after you learn rails you start learning node <laughs> just like randomly yeah <laughs> and, and i think and maybe learn too. python and yeah. i was like what the heck <laughs> what is this what's going on here <laughs> i think mean, they think that maybe like the more technologies you know the more marketable you are but uh I'm a big believer of get good at one first and then learn the, yeah. the others afterwards. But I think it's oh. interesting the stacks that a yeah. lot of these schools teach. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we could talk more about that um, later. But yeah, overall, I know this is a pretty open ended question, but like, what was the curriculum like? How was, uh, what was the kind of like, how do they teach? Because I know maybe the online and the in person one could be pretty different. So, Christian, you want to go first, and then maybe yeah. you could talk about your like online experience. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember. I think we started out learning just like bare bones Ruby, um, and then they did Sinatra, and then Rails, and then that was like halfway, and then we did Vanilla JS, and then React, and like the last section was like all project work. 
how many projects? Um, yeah, yeah, five. Yeah, yeah, one for every module. Yeah, one for every module. Yeah. And so in your in your cohort, and uh, for the in person for Chicago, it was like everything was still like everything was still like a cohort based. So you had to pass. Um, I'm, you have to like pass a certain test. Like I'm, yeah. I'm not as familiar with that because I didn't have to do that during the golden age. So. Yeah. You, you <laughs> what, what, is that? To, what does it mean to pass a, a module? Yeah. You, so they had like these module exams basically where you sit, I think it's like 90 minutes or it, it varied depending on the module. And then you got graded on that. Um, and if you failed, you can have a retake. Um, but I think if you like failed it twice, then you either get like held back for a different cohort or you have to like or you just like fail out of the program interesting did, did uh, it a little bit differently in atlanta if you're curious yeah let's let's keep talking yeah how was your atlanta so experience? very similar five modules the last the fifth one is your three-week project that you do by yourself so it doesn't really count like you can't fail mod five i mean i guess you could if you didn't do any work but at this point, you're like in it to win it. So you're going to do all your work. It would be wild to fail mod five. But they would have like these coding challenges. And the cohort before mine was exactly how you said. But our cohort and all the cohorts after, because so many people were failing out, <laughs> um, they changed it to where if you failed your coding challenge, you had to do a guided project after rather than retake the coding challenge again. Interesting. It what, helped. What does a guided project mean? Does some, can you elaborate on that? Um, they would pair two people together and basically you would pair program whatever the project was. So after you did your code challenge, it was always in the middle of the week, like a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Then you had like two or three days to do a project for that specific module. So instead of doing the project by yourself, you had to do the project with another person. And if that project like didn't meet standards, then you guys both failed. Jesus. <laughs> Real stressful. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Only a smidge. Um, what about you, EJ? What Mine's your... a bit different, apparently. It was, the curriculum was the same. It was Ruby, Sinatra, Rails, JS, React with Redux. Uh, and the, we didn't have a test at the end, so much as at the end of each module, there was a module project. And then we just had a like a project review that was, for us, pass-fail, but apparently they actually gave us a grade that we never saw. But as far as we were concerned, it was pass-fail. Did you feel like these modules checkups or these module tests, pass fails, was it a good way to um, see if you were actually ready to get to the next module? Or I think the the reviews were because you had to talk your way through the project. You had to mm. explain. They're also good practice for, I guess, interviews because you definitely had to talk your way through your code. They had to talk, like, explain your decisions, why you did this, that explain that you knew what you were doing as opposed to just being like, I copy and pasted this code from here. Right. And then you had to submit, there was like a blog post mm -hmm. attached to it. And then there was, you had to do like a video component to it too. It's like a video it's walkthrough that you submitted to your reviewer. So cor correct me if I'm wrong, it, Christian, yours sounded more like, and, uh, and uh, Alex, yours sounded more like, um, like actual tests, maybe interview style, like Java, like specific, hey, solve this problem. But for EJ, it might have been more project based checkups. Definitely like, was. Yeah, like, yeah I wonder if that's definitely wonder. really stressful. Um, I think that's why they actually ended up changing like how it worked if you failed. Um, full disclaimer, I like flunked out of college. And one of the reasons is because I have test anxiety. So it's not like a multiple choice test it's not like that so it never like triggered my test anxiety although a lot of people especially in my cohort and before and after really struggled with their coding challenges because they would get like so nervous about it yeah. but for me it, it was just like solving like you had tasks and you had to check them off so it was basically like you have to do this make the app you know fetch to your api make the app render a sort like it was all these things that you had to do and for me I've, i found it really fun and so 
everyone else in my cohort would get really mad at me because they're like, why are you always the first one to finish? And like, why are you always the first one to like get it all right? And like, you always do the bonus stuff. And I found them fun, but a lot of people did not. And I think that's why they ended up changing them. Yeah. I see. Mine yeah. were the same, like the same way. It was like, they give you kind of like a skeleton or like some formatted project with tasks, a task list, like render these robots images or something and then do a certain variety of whatever react tasks um but yeah i think like the time component definitely got to a lot of people yeah. can you elaborate on that what do you mean time component like it was there a certain time limit you were had to pass the module like where did they oh, say yeah. you have 20 minutes to do this or yeah. how does that work yeah so they took us like the way it worked was like you'd have a testing day and like you'd go into a room and they like oh, wow. start a 90 minute clock and they're like, okay, this is the repo. Um, Jesus like, Christ. Clone it and then finish these task lists and like submit a PR when you're done or something like that. Um, and like, that was it. That was like, whether or not you pass the module or not, wow. if you could do this in 90 minutes. Um, well, not just that, but yeah. don't forget you had to clone it and push it within the time frame. So that oh, yeah. tripped up a lot of people too. Yeah. And they, they did also say, so, I don't know if they did this for, for you in Atlanta, but in Chicago, like our instructors did say like these, like the solutions are on a branch here and like you could totally cheat if you wanted to. And like, we're not going to stop you, but like, if we see you doing it, then you're going to fail. And I was like, so you're like basically saying, okay, you can definitely cheat on this oh, yeah. if you wanted to do so. We yep. were definitely not told that, and I didn't we, know enough about Git to switch branches. But <laughs> oh yeah, we got we got told uh, we got we got told about the solution branches for like the labs and stuff. But uh, with with our take homes, not the take homes, the projects, uh, another component to the review because I literally forgot about it until just now was um, after you explained your code, they were to have you add a feature or do like a live change to it. Mm. Uh, the time wasn't so much a problem because if you couldn't finish in time, I guess if they could see that you were on the right track, they'd just be like, just finish this, push the change, and then send it to me and I'll review it. And in terms of the time limit to get it done, there was project week and then a week after project week or a week and a half or whatever until the next module started. So you'd have between you finishing and the time the next module started to just schedule a slot to review so you were incentivized to review as soon as possible. So if you failed the review, you could reschedule that again before the module turnaround. This was for every project. This was for were... every project, yeah. Got it. That makes sense. Interesting. There's, so it feels, I don't know if... Like we each EJ, went to a different school? Yeah, it just sounds like you also <laughs> went to a different school, but maybe it's different for online or maybe they're it adapting... Might be. They might be adapting, which is usually a I know, good sign, right? I know because... just after I left, they had uh, launched a new curriculum, which is apparently right. wildly different than the one we took. Right. Well, so I haven't it, talked to anyone who's, I'm sorry, I haven't talked to anybody who's done that curriculum yet. So. Uh, I've passively talked to someone. I didn't really get into it, but I know they start with JavaScript and React, and I think they even go into Node at front with like, and they may also cool. go into Native. So I think okay. like the first project was a React project that maybe was also React Native at the same time. I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a while. I've been hmm. meaning to reach out and find out what the hell the curriculum looks like now. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard they at least added hooks. So there's that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so just open question. Like, what did you guys like about the curriculum or the experience? Um, I mean, honestly, as much as I shit on Flatiron, practices i really enjoyed like when i went like i looked for like i had a one and a half hour commute both ways and i really liked every day doing it and i don't know if that's like just i like coding um but like also the people were awesome and if you're in person in chicago um there was like so much free alcohol like <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like I was like you were definitely drinking like every day. It was kind of nuts actually. The the, the friendships, yeah. the close uh, yeah. <laughs> camaraderie. Yeah. I'm sure uh, EJ was drinking with all his classmates online. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what about what about you, EJ? Um uh what did I like about it? I the, the people. 
the curriculum was fine. The the structure was fairly loose. I don't know. I heard it like when you were in person, like you were in the classroom with the cohort lead eight hours mm-hmm. a day or whatever it was. Whereas we just had here are the markers that we would like you to hit to stay on track going through each module. You have three hour long lectures a week plus office hours on Friday. And that's all the face time we got with our cohort leads. So for us, it was a lot of just like figure the shit out on your own. And we probably it depended on how you got along with the rest of your cohort, because we all, especially towards the end, just like leaned on each other a lot. Mm hmm. And how do you guys keep in touch with the online curriculum? Is it just, hey, let's go on a FaceTime and uh, do Slack. that, or was it just Slack? It was okay. Slack. So was there, would you say there was rarely any FaceTime then? It was just mostly just Slack messaging? And there was whatnot? a lot of Slack messaging or Zoom. We used a lot Zoom. of Zoom. Got it. Alex? My teachers that I had, the my cohort mates, the in-person experience itself was awesome. I spent 12 hours every single day, seven days a week at the WeWork building doing the code stuff because I had like a nine month old uh, who <laughs> turned one while I was in the program. And so for me, I was like, man, if I'm missing like all these important moments with her, like her walking and her talking and like her birthday and stuff, then I'm going to make it count. So I actually really enjoyed it and I like really rocked it and yeah. genuinely graduated like top of my class, like not tooting mm-hmm. my own horn. I just did. <laughs> I in. And so like I had a great time, but I could not have done it online. No way. Yeah, same. Yeah. Definitely it, not. I, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. It's It was really rough. The, our one uh, instructor was just like, this is literally the hardest version of this program because you have like four hours of FaceTime with us a week. And like yeah. my, my, my instructors were great. The two that I had, um, it kind of fell apart in the end, which we can get into later. <laughs> right. With, with and them. The thing is, I mean, I did mine in person too. And just being able to go to a physical location, spend hours and hours there literally every day, you kind of build these like accountability partners and you're seeing that face to face interaction. So if the other people are struggling with you, you kind of see that you get that kind of, Oh, oh like team vibe. And whatnot. So that might have been missing in the online version, probably. No, we definitely still have that. Oh, you did have we, that. We, it was weird how like different like groups of the cohort would just like faction up because we all had like certain people that we would always work with. Mm-hmm. And like towards, especially towards awesome. the end in like projects, there was like the the water cooler. Like, there was a, just a Zoom chat that was always open. Mm-hmm. So like a lot of us would always just like just hang out in the in the water cooler while we worked on our project. Right. So outside of just Flatiron School as a business, in terms of like a pure like curriculum perspective, what did you guys think could have been improved? It could have been more up to date. Yeah. A lot more sure. up to date. And it could have, it really shorted us on data structures and algorithm stuff. Yeah. I, I very distinctly remember a line in the curriculum just being like, congratulations, you just did your first algorithm. But don't worry about that. It's not super important. You can get into that later. And then it never did. Yeah. Come I don't look. even think they were doing ES6 stuff like arrow functions. For me, they were. Um, they, got to, they got to like ES6. So they're time. adapting at least. They <laughs> are, yeah. Still no hooks. Yeah. No hooks, though. <laughs> there was, yeah. Yeah, I did not learn hooks. I, I remember interviewing for my first job. And they were like, oh, okay. So like, you know, hooks and, you know, like, you know, ES6, like arrow functions and stuff. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> So that was a little embarrassing because, I mean, hooks and ES6, it wasn't that new. It should have been in the curriculum because it was incredibly relevant. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, like, echoing EJ's point, like, on data structures and algorithms, like, I think they're kind of, like, screwing over the, their students a bit by not telling, like, even oh, introducing yeah. them really like Mm -hmm. yeah and i mean people will say like oh you don't have to do like them to necessarily get a job and stuff but it makes getting if you're good at them it makes getting a job a hundred times easier they because of course they're just like this is an array this is a hash or an object or whatever you're writing in uh but i but what big o notation what in the hell is no idea Mm. no idea what any of that was after graduation could i ask a question then when you guys were graduated 
and ready to potent, like get into the job market, how often did they ask you data structures and algorithm questions? Oh, hundred In percent. Interviews. Of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's like leak code, leak code or hacker rank is ninety percent of what they send you. For the interesting, the what kind of part. companies were you applying to? Were you applying to bigger, like fang companies? Were you applying to smaller startups? Like how? Not. I'm trying to understand the. Actually, no, I did. An, I did of, a Twitch. Right. Thing. I, I just ran the gauntlet from some startups to mid levels to. I applied to like a Twitch apprenticeship. It's so interesting because I've even applied for mid level roles and senior level roles for. Uh, my current status and even then i don't really get asked like data structures and algorithm questions and but when i was applying to amazon i knew that i had to study data <laughs> structures and algorithms because yeah. that's what they do right so i'm just curious and kind of surprised actually so many companies that you guys apply to that re required you to know data structures and algorithms because like usually with smaller startups they tend to not care as much but i can see why it could only help but if you had to like prioritize, like, am I actually even good at programming versus do I understand data structures and algorithms? I would kind of more lean towards the programming side, but it's kind of hard to balance everything out in three months. But I wonder if that's more of a, should the curriculum be longer to include data structures and algorithms or? It might now. Uh, I know they relaunched yeah. it, so they may have course corrected a bit. I think it's well, like right. one of those things you get thrown at the end. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, but go ahead. I just not like... I think it's like one, if they had added like an extra two weeks where it's like mm -hmm. all you did was data structure and algorithm problems for two weeks. Even I think one. you're, yeah, even one. I think that would be enough to like right. kind of jumpstart you. I mean, there was a right. week for SQL. There were two <laughs> days for SQL and then the rest for active record. They could have done any data structure and algorithm stuff in there. Although I guess in their defense, there was like the post graduation curriculum that they like they unlocked for you or they unlocked for us when we were done that had like node a node curriculum that was probably four years old. There was definitely like a data structures and algorithm section in there. There was Angular, all kinds of random stuff. I definitely did not get access to that. Oh, well, I mean, it was four nice. years old when I got it. So who knows where <laughs> <No>. it was? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what bothered me the most? So you graduate, you have the certificate. You're like, oh, yeah, boo, yeah. I just did this like 15 week thing. I'm a programmer. And then after you graduate, they make you take a practice interview that practice interview is an algorithm interview. Oh, yeah. I had so one I failed the it. Amazon guy. I got a one out of five. I, I failed my interview. I, and so I was like, wait, well, what, what did, did I just learn for 15 weeks? Who did you do wait, yours through? Um, I think they made me do it through like Hacker Rank or something. Like, I uh, don't even remember, honestly. It was... What, I don't what even was know. The, what, was the, what was the point of the interview? Like, if you fail it, what happens? Nothing. It was just a practice, was so they you, yeah. you get like <laughs> it was, feedback. On it was a, it was a simulated talk. technical interview because yeah, we did exactly. a, we did a simulated cultural with our career coach, and then they farmed out the simulated technical. Oh, and God. I guess it all depended on the guy you had because the guy I had it was talk me through React, this, that, and the other thing. He was able to talk through React, and he was like, "Did really good at that." However, um, you can't code. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> I mean, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but he was like, "No, you just you, you need to get better at this." At coding, at, at, at coding, yeah. the The actual coding part, he was just like, "I could see you kind of knew where you wanted to go, but you just locked up." And I always locked up during the the live code portion of all the stuff anyway, because I have a habit of overcomplicating literally everything in my own head. Mm. And being put on the spot to just be like, hey, do this, that, and this. You never learned how to do it directly, but feel free to Google while we're doing it. Cool. But it was... Probably they difficult. they yeah. could have done a better job at preparing yeah. us to get a job. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember I had... It, my guy was like a senior Amazon engineer. And he had asked me a leak code question where the optimal solution involved a monotonic queue. And I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I don't wow. either. <laughs> you just made that up. And, yeah. <laughs> and and afterwards he was like, Oh, well, you like you did a good job like for 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 like what you knew. And then I was like, Yeah, I definitely wasn't gonna be able to come up with that solution. <laughs> so I, I think after that I was pretty disillusioned by like I was just like, 
all right, this is actually what's going to happen in interviews. And like, I'm just going to ignore what Flatiron recommends. To do. I think because they were like, oh, don't focus on, you don't need to focus on algorithms. It's just like, just improve your pre personal projects or, or something like that. Yeah, that's so interesting because if a school is so dedicated on just making sure you know how to code and build projects, I take sending them off to do a hacker rank interview because I'm actually not a huge fan of hacker rank because if a company is third party resourcing out their <laughs> interview process, that's usually indicative of like they probably don't even have time for you as an employee generally. So I've actually failed a lot of hacker rank interviews even in my time because I was like 40 minutes in and I just said, all right, well, I'm not going to solve this problem. So what do you want to do for the next 15 minutes? <laughs> and then we just kind of sat there looking at each other. I was like, okay, cool. See ya. But um, that, yeah, that's a little tough one because I, I, as a new developer that's been coding for three to four or five months, I will feel pretty defeated and asking myself, like, am I even ready for interviews? So that's a pretty tough one. Like for me, when I was doing my interview process in the beginning, it was just pair programming with someone and like building out a feature in Rails together. And then he just saw my like thought process of how I did a feature. And then he was like, oh, great job. Like, it's good to know that you know what models and controllers and all of this stuff is. And then it's like, all right, junior developer role, you're hired, right? <laughs> so it, it felt a lot more intuitive and just like what I'm familiar with. So um, I think also when you apply to jobs, it, it really is dependent on the type of company you're applying for, the type of role you're applying for and all that stuff. So, um, but with that being said, like, what was the experience like with a career coach? Cause I never had one when I went and I, I've heard some mixed reviews. Some people love their career coach. Some people Alex, ask after for you. new career coaches. You want me to go first? Or do yeah, you after, mean after you, first, Alex. no, after you, please. I'll say this the nicest way possible but I fired my first career coach and got another one. The second career coach that I had, so I have to explain how it works. They actually pay out, like they outsource career mm -hmm. coaches and they are not technical career coaches. They are people who are basically like, they give you advice on how to General interview advice. and like how to, portray yourself, but in regards to technical jobs, they are useless. And I say all of that to say, I adored my second career coach. I still talk with him. We check up with each other all the time. He is excellent, but he's not a technical career coach. He knows nothing about programming. Wonderful person, wonderful advice, but not exactly the most helpful. So when I signed up for Flatiron, you know, I was told that there was going to be like career partnerships and they were going to be throwing jobs at me. And I was under the impression that my career coach was going to be kind of like walking me through the steps of like interviewing and like what this was going to look like and how to do it. And that was like not at all what it was. It was just like general advice on my resume, general advice of kind of like how I portrayed myself and how I should think about myself during an interview. I mean, he went above and beyond, mm. but technically they were useless. I got zero job referrals from Flatiron. <laughs> but somehow you were so, able to get a job within a month, you said? Yeah. So was that all you, like hustling, basically? Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I took job searching as like a job. So I was spending 40 mm -hmm. to 50 hours a week looking for jobs, interviewing. I stuck to strictly um, startups. I knew there was no way I was getting into the big company. So I stuck to strictly startups and ended up with a wonderful startup, but it was just luck of the draw. So, right. yeah. Yeah. My, my experience was like, kind of, I mean, thankfully I avoided the first awful, I didn't have, my career coach was cool. Like he was great. Um, but same, like he just helped out with a couple of things on the resume, not technical at all. Um, and honestly, like, I don't think we even really met that. I think we met like twice, maybe. Because I, I think the second time I was like, okay, this is my plan. I'm going to do this, this, and this for the job, for the interviews, or like to, to find the job. And he was basically like, yep, sounds good. And then I think yeah. like the next week or the second, second week after I got a job. Um, so huh. that was kind of that. Yeah, my, my guy's largely the same. Like, he was super great with what he helped with, which was a lot of the more cultural HR side of things. Mm -hmm. 
uh, our first meeting, he was like, look, I've never really worked in tech before, but I've done this, 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 and this, which was like head of HR of some fairly substantial companies. But that I was like, all right, cool. He was really helpful when it came to like, yeah, I need help writing this email or follow up email, stuff like that. He was always super on hand yes. if I needed him for that. Um, but yeah, he wasn't super helpful with the tech side of things, which he was upfront about. So I knew that going in, uh, there was someone, there was like, there was like a follow up technical. No, there was a second cultural interview you, you could do after you hit a certain amount of days without a job. And the guy that was another coach did that was a technically was a technical guy, which mm-hmm. I didn't know they had those. Hmm. <laughs> cool. But yeah, Maybe my guy was super helpful. <laughs> I, ha- I, I assume so. Yeah. I've heard some, but I've heard some horror stories from some of these tech coaches, and not technical coaches, the career coaches that they have. And I also didn't really get any uh, right. help from the was it career partnership. Oh yeah, services. Zero. Zero. I got nothing. Zero. Like no, I actually nothing. got a refer. Like they sent me a thing, and I applied through them. I let them know. Never heard about it again. Saw mm-hmm. randomly saw the same company on LinkedIn. Applied. Heard back in forty eight hours. Without so, any yeah. without any help from Flatiron or whatever. That's what that's what I was gonna ask. Is what were what was if any if there was like a career service team, uh, do they, were they give you intros or do they give you anything? Like, they, or did you just kind of feel like an island? Tell they you to write blogs they said that, that, but they said that like, they're doing it all in the background. You won't hear anything unless something pops. I, I have the feeling that they're more helpful if you're in one of like the flat iron cities, like they'd mm. probably be super helpful if you were in like New York. No, no. Oh, I then. wanted jobs I'll, I'll, in I'll New go York go. only, <laughs> and they would not send me any New York jobs at all. Interesting. It was so frustrating. They kept sending me like Texas jobs and like North Carolina jobs, and I was like, "Guys, I only want to work in New York. Don't send me anything else." Oh, um, I'm wrong. Wait. So yeah. when they when they send it to you, are they sending it through a connection, or are they just saying, "Hey, I found this job no. listing," and then it is a apply. boilerplate email that says, "Hey." Yeah whatever your name is, or it might, in fact, I don't even think it has your name on it. I think it just says, Hey, we've got this job. If you're interested, here's the link. And you like click the link to Mm. apply. I don't remember if it took you to a job description or if it took you to like a portal that they had. I think it depended on the job. I think it did depend on the job. And I think I did actually apply to a couple of them. And I never heard back. No, no. never. And they're like, please reply to this email to let me know that you applied. I'm like, all right, cool. That means you'll help or something no nothing and that was it i mean they would never follow up with you or anything about it so once you applied and sent the email sometimes they'd say like okay great thanks but then they would never say hey you know i've been talking to this company and they're not going to go forward with you or whatever like they were not like a third-party recruiter at all they were just pretending to make connections to basically fulfill the promise that they made when you signed up <laughs> the funny the funniest thing about that is towards the end of my job search i would see job postings in our discord in the job posting section like two or three days i'm like all right someone's posting about this twitch apprenticeship how long before Flatiron emails me about it and it was about <laughs> 72 hours so i heard about it first in the discord before they before they awesome. decided i actually think i applied before they sent me the email Cool. So in case uh, everyone was wa- that's listening is wondering, um, Alex started a Discord channel for Flatiron School graduates, and that's how I actually was able to connect with all three of y'all. So yeah. I'm very lucky and blessed to be there for being a dinosaur in terms of Flatiron School years. But um, <laughs> now I can blessed. see why now I can see why you keep saying the golden era <laughs> in 2015 <laughs> in yeah. some regards. And uh, yeah, I think I was really lucky. I mean, obviously I was super lucky in the sense that we didn't really have to worry about applying they just said just study and then we'll give you connections and at that time there were just not many students right so with more students more scale more scale there's going to be probably some shortcuts you have to make as a business so totally get it from that perspective wait but... did they give you like genuine job leads mm-hmm. oh well, that's great uh, <laughs> yeah. I think nice. hair, I you said you said 2015 right <laughs> yeah the did you have a career <laughs> fair we did yep we didn't have a career fair. In fact, hey. <laughs> so we were supposed to have lunch and learns. We didn't even have the lunch and learns with uh-huh. the p- 
places to be hiring you. Wow. So Nothing. obviously things have changed for the better or worse, depending on your perspective. Mine <laughs> mine's yeah, actually did have a career fair, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> did anyone get jobs from the career fair? Uh, no. Well, not in my cohort. I did get offered a venture capital dude came up to me and he liked my mod five projects so much. He was like, Hey, if you actually like want to do this, like, here's my card. But cool. didn't. Was, that was really cool, but I didn't want this. My, so. my one friend who was the one that recommended me to flat iron, he went in around 2015. He did get hired off one of the job fairs, So he didn't even really job search. Likewise. Nice. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. So I do have a question. Um, of your cohort, did everyone graduate and get a job? Like, what percentage Ooh. do you think uh, I was successful? I don't want to do that math. Does success mean, like, they got a job as a software engineer? Or... Yes. Okay. That's my yeah. version of success. Yeah. That's why you went to a... Please let me look camera. at my... Within a time frame or just since graduation? I would think since graduation or, okay. like, yeah... So we started with 10 or did we start with 12? I can't remember. Anyways, a ballpark is fine. <laughs> I think it was 10 of us and five of us graduated. And of the five that graduated, I was the first to get a job. I was not actually someone in my cohort got hired by Flatiron part time. He was the first to get a job because he got a job immediately. I was the second to get a job. And then I think it took the other three people like six months to get a job. And I know one of them got their money back. So, and it took him a year to get a job. Yeah. So overall, everyone is now in software engineering, but definitely took, took a, a lot of like yeah. more than 50% of us, more than six months to all be successful. So. I think for mine, we had we started with like thirteen people. One failed, um, so twelve graduated, and I was the first one to get a job. And then I think two of my other friends who were in court got jobs like a few weeks after me, maybe a month after. All in all, I think five people out of the twelve are working as software engineers. I think a few are doing like. IT or like software tangent jobs. Um, yeah. Does that trigger an ISA if you work in an IT? I think role? it does. I think yeah. if you earn a certain amount and it's like in industry, like if you get like, I don't know. Adjacent. Yeah. Help desk or like a QA also. The way that my ISA is written is you could go be a waitress. They don't care. But as long as your income is above $3,333 a month, you have to pay your ISA for nine years. Like wow. that's how long you're on the hook for until you hit the payment cap. So, I always thought you had to be in some type of industry, but nope. maybe not. It's any income. And they check your, um, like they check your tax returns. Yeah. Interesting. EJ, what about you? Glad you saved me for last. Um, <clears throat> we had like 50 people at the start. Of our cohort, wow. <clears throat> and cohort. I believe we ended with like nineteen. Wow! Most to, most of those people, I don't think any of the people who left our co cohort like straight up dropped out. I think most of them fell back. So I don't think any of them like failed. Failed. Mm. Um, because a few of them I knew, like some of the guys that were doing really well, like. His wife had a kid, so, you know, can't do school for the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. So he just fell back to the cohort behind us. Um, of the people who I graduated with, half got jobs that I know That's of. Okay. I, I, some of them I lost contact with, but I think at mm -hmm. this point, most of them have jobs. Some mm -hmm. of them got it within the first month. I just got mine the end of the last month. I know a friend of mine who was in the cohort just accepted an offer. 97% placement rate, though. <laughs> <laughs> is this that I'm part so of it? Is this that part of this now? 
We're no, doing I that now? Have, I, I, no, I have a quick question before <laughs> we go into the stuff like that. But I think ultimately, yeah, it, it seems like some people have taken a lot longer to get a job. Like you, EJ, you, I, when maybe when you first joined Flatiron School, your the expectation was like maybe two months, max like four or five, four months possibly. 100%. Right. But 97% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about it is during that time, like are they sh- showing you is Flatiron School doing any type of like support along the way? Like, cause nine months is a long time from graduation, right? So do they do um, these check-ins or like, I was doing weekly meetings with my career coach. Got it. But that was but me scheduling to, it. Yeah. And, but you also said your career coach wasn't technical. He wasn't, but he was just helpful with some things. He was helpful. He, it, was, it got to a point, honest to God, it was emotional support. He was just there yeah. for like moral support. But he was also helped out with, I don't know, keeping track of whatever the hell else he was keeping track right. of. But so, it got yeah, it, it definitely like- got to a certain point mm-hmm. relatively quickly, if I'm being honest, that it, he became moral support. Don't get me wrong. Great moral support. Right. And he was always there. Like if I needed him to help with like an email or something. But mm-hmm. after the initial batch of meetings were like, all right, your resume is done. Your LinkedIn's done. Let me help you with interview stuff. And then that was like four or five weeks. And then my mic stand is falling. And uh, after that, just talking about what I was doing job hunt wise that week and trying to help see if he knew when he wanted any of the companies I was applying to, stuff like that. Right. So specifically for you, EJ, I feel that Flatiron School maybe taught you a certain amount of coding, but did you feel like you needed to just get better at it and just you just kind of had to do your own individual studying more or less? Well, I mean, that's coding in general, isn't it? It is, that's, but that's honestly the, the job. At the end of the day, schools but in general or coding boot camps in general, they teach, I, it, they advertise it in a way where they definitely they say, do. Let yeah. me say that. But um, in your experience, it sounds like you just kind of had to. Do I think some individual learning of some sort. If kind of I that. knew now what, if I knew then what I know now, I probably just would have picked up like a Udemy course because. It's all the promises of just like, oh, it's you'll get a job within X amount of days or your money back, which, by the way, there were many hoops to jump through to get that. Mm-hmm. Um, here's our here's our statistics. Don't look into where we get the numbers from. Yeah, but I think and it's not just Flatiron. I'm not just bragging on Flatiron right. or this with this part. I think coding boot camps in general are clickbaity. Because they offer a lot of promises that the market can't keep. No, definitely not. Especially this past year. Oh, yeah. That was one of the things that concerned me the most when I saw people flocking to boot camps. Because, you know, they had been <laughs> laid off or whatever. They were like, oh, yeah. oh, look, I could go here for 15 weeks and then get a job in a month. Like, And then I'll be making six figures. Uh-huh. No. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, just, just, just to play the, I guess, devil's advocate on the other end is I don't think a Udemy course can really compare to a coding bootcamp in certain ways because it's really hard to replicate uh, a cohort style of learning. And what that price means to someone can be totally different, right? Like some people could say, I just learn better by myself and I, I'm going to learn everything by myself. I don't need to ask anybody for help. I don't need a career coach. I don't need a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, emotional support person to help me with my resume. I yeah. can just do everything by myself with a ten dollar Udemy course. That's what that costs for each person could be totally different, right? Because maybe for Christian, he was able to go into a Chicago office or WeWork or whatever you want to call it, be around other classmates that are keeping up in the same pace as he is, and you could ask each other questions, that's... build projects together, and whatnot. But I think saying that a Udemy course is like could totally solve it. I it from a high level, yes, that makes sense because code is code, but it's hard to say that it's like absolutely. That's fair. I it best. also yeah. depends on I guess how you learn, right? Like, and I and I'm just saying that, and even though I also very much benefited from having the cohort, mm-hmm. but I was think in terms of is it worth fifteen grand? Mm-hmm. Probably, yeah. Eh? No. Eh? I think I'm like, paying like nineteen thousand. Yeah. yeah, is it worth twenty? Is it is no? It? <laughs> I, I mean, it's, maybe like twelve. I mean, if you yeah. get a job, if you manage to get lucky and get a job relatively <clears throat> soon out, the cost of the boot camp or the cost of your uh, cost of a new career in tech definitely 
wins on the scales in terms of the cost of a boot camp. But the longer you draw the job search out, the less worth it it is. It's a, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, that makes I, sense. I, I, I mean, I would do like, it again. Yeah. I, mean, I did the math like because I, I knew the ISA like was going to be the extra 50 percent interest, basically. Right. So I did the math like the whole reason I did the ISA was if you didn't do it, if you didn't get a job past six months, you don't pay anything. So I was like, well, is six grand worth Asterisk. the insurance of me getting a job? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I mean, I think it still is worth, I mean, like, I don't know, like I would pay up front knowing what I know now, but I'm like survivor. Yeah. Bias, right. <laughs> like, yeah. EJ would definitely take the ISA. Really. <laughs> I, I did. I, I did a loan. I didn't do an ISA. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I went through one of their uh, server, uh, service lenders or whatever. So I got, I, I got a loan for like 14% and it was like a four year loan or something like that. Yeah. But I think like Flatiron does serve an important purpose, like when you're getting a job and that is like, it's a name and it gives you a good reason for like, not like that's true. Resume gap wise. Um, if you had to explain, okay, I quit my job. I did this boot camp for that's fair. three months versus like, I quit my job. I did a Udemy courses. course. <laughs> Oh my gosh! It, yeah. it just makes more. Sense I bought an online people. course. Yeah, that's why I didn't work for nine months. Well, that's a, that's so true because I work with a lot of self-taught developers, and you know, coding boot camp is just too expensive. They don't want to do an ISA. Yeah, it, they go to free code camp. They go to o Odin project. Everything's free online, but their resume and their LinkedIn is so hard to optimize yeah. for a hiring manager because it's like, how do you even explain to them? It's like, hey, I work in. I don't know, retail or something, but I also code on the side. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you trust and, me. <laughs> yeah, and and being on the other side now, I like interview people. If I'm looking at a resume, I definitely will wait a boot camp more, like than if somebody just had Udemy courses listed on there. Yeah, that's definitely fair. I think. Yeah. Um, what I've actually wound up what find found myself uh, suggesting to people is like, do the Odin project first, see if you like it. And then from there, look into a Udemy course or look into a boot camp and go for the extra mile for the extra stuff if you like doing it. Because some people might just wind up like, here's my 15 grand. I'm going to join a boot camp. Oh, shit. I hate coding. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. now? Right. Because it's crazy to say this because I actually didn't know too much coding until I went to a coding bootcamp. Actually, no, I went out on my way to learn more because I just felt like I wasn't going to be ready. But I think before they always advertised it in a way where you didn't need any prerequisites and whatnot. But now whenever someone asks me, I'm like, make sure you do this, make sure you do this, make sure you do this. And I'm like, wait, am I just teaching you to be a self-taught developer before you go to a coding bootcamp? But it just seems that some people are so unprepared when they start. And there's just so many different levels, it feels like when they yeah. join a coding bootcamp because maybe the coding bootcamp should be a little bit more responsible, not just Flatiron School, but I just know coding yeah. camps in general, they take in a lot of students. And I've heard there are some that I've heard that are also much better with the job hunt part after. Like I know, I know someone who went to Turing and was worked after they went to Turing as a career coach and he was in the industry as a career coach with Turing and they're much better at the, the job hunt support after. Yeah, I think Flatiron's most valuable thing is their alumni because they have been around for so long that if you want to work at a company, there's a really good chance that a Flatiron alumni works there. So you can reach out to them on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I saw you went to Flatiron like six years ago. How was it? I went to Flatiron too. So <laughs> wild. Like, how do you like your job at insert company name here? That has like definitely gotten me some really great, at least chats, maybe not internal referrals, but a couple. Um, so I think that's been really valuable. It's another reason I started the Discord because, I mean, you guys are my, <laughs> like the best thing I got out of bootcamp other than the knowledge of programming. So, hey, same. Yeah. yeah. So I actually I hired a lot of Flatiron School graduates um, at my last job because they went to Flatiron School and uh, my boss knew I went to Flatiron School, so I would just interview them. And all that barrier of, oh, does this person have a degree or does this person have yeah. a technical degree? All of that really goes out of the way. I just read their resume and just 
to be honest, like when you look at a resume, maybe Christian, you kind of know too. It's like you don't really spend too much time looking at it. It's like, oh, they coded. Okay, cool. And then you just <laughs> kind of ask them a bunch of questions when you're at the interviews. But I mean, yeah, the community is definitely great because even Alex and I, we've talked because we both went to Flatiron School, although it was six year gap <laughs> or full five year gap. And yeah. we're just doing this now. So yeah, I think I think definitely like the Udemy, like they'll teach you, but sometimes that community it's yeah, the price can be very steep, but maybe it could last a lifetime. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, definitely. Um, before we close out, and maybe this could be the last topic we talk about, and I don't think this is specific to Flatiron School, but just maybe just ISAs in general. Um, oh, I, was... I have a pretty strong opinions about not doing ISAs, and I know Christian, you did the math, but like, one would you would you still recommend someone doing an ISA since you've done it, or? At what point would you not recommend? Is it like, if you believe in yourself, then don't do an ISA. If you don't Clap. I, I mean, it kind of, it kind of is like that. Um, I mean, for, if you can say like, no matter what they say, like, oh, it's not a loan. It's a loan. Like it's a loan with 50% interest. Um, and you can't get out of it in like almost any way. Um, so I would say just get a loan. <laughs> like, uh, do what and, I did. Yeah, and also I've, I've known people who, like, can who like kind of get screwed on getting their money back also because they make it like very string. They have like very stringent like requirements, like weekly requirements that you have to do within the six months after you graduate in order to qualify for a refund. So they also spend weeks combing through those requirements to see if they can catch you on something, which I think is pretty crappy. They, for me, it was like four day turnaround when I put mine in and they sent me back like a list of like, this is what didn't meet it. And most of them, honest to God, were just like, I forgot to put that guy's job title. There were like maybe four, but I think, and they, when I even talked to them after the fact, they were like, yeah, you had like 250 valid ones and four not valid ones. You're fine. But like it's it's when they like look at a year's or a six months worth of like contacts. It's like all external recruiters, and they're like, no. But they do the hoops are. I think you have to make a decision early on in your job hunt whether or not you want to try to keep up the money back requirements or not, because I don't think the requirements to meet for the money back are conducive to getting a job at all. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. It feels counterintuitive sometimes to just hit these metrics, but it doesn't actually help you. Yeah, it was, term. what was it? Seven seven or eight LinkedIn LinkedIn contacts eight, or just con eight. Yeah. yeah, it was like eight, not even LinkedIn, but eight like connections. And they have to like, be different. Yes, eight different connections, but they can like repeat. Like you can talk to someone from the same place like once a week. It's that like makes eight so connections. Much more sense. I, like, I don't know if you guys are seeing this now, now that you're working, but I get so many LinkedIn requests from Flatiron School students. It's 100% why. Like, what is going yeah. on here? It's, it's... I was like, did they see all my YouTube channel? <laughs> like, <"That's> <laughs> I'm famous. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm an influencer. No, you're not out. Um, <laughs> LinkedIn famous. Not yet. I, it's, yeah, it was like eight connections, five Git commits. Which is easy if you're working on anything. Very easy. Yeah. And a blog post, which was the hardest thing for me because I'm like, yeah. I don't what a technical blog post. Yeah. That was definitely the hardest thing for me. And it got to the point at the end where I was just like, here's a walkthrough of a leak of a leak code problem I did this week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean I made a decision after my first week of filling out the spreadsheet and trying to like do all the things that you just mentioned. I made a decision after the first week that there was no way I would have time <laughs> to meet all their requirements and get a job. So I and threw raise a away... child. Yeah. Oh, and have a child. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No way. I actually threw away the whole spreadsheet. I was like, I'm not doing this. I don't care about the money back guarantee. Yeah. I need a job. I don't need to like check these boxes off. It's yeah. the mm -hmm. last thing I have time for. But to answer your question with the ISA, the only scenario in which I would advise someone to get an ISA is if you are like 18 years old, you live with your parents, 
You mm. don't have bills. You don't have children or dependents or a, a pet, nothing. <laughs> because what they're doing is they're taking 10% of your income before taxes. You're then paying taxes on your entire income. And then you're paying them that 10%. Actually, ends up being more than ten percent because, like, you've already paid taxes on it. So, I like can't afford my ISA, and I make a ton of money. I feel like, yeah. I, but I mean, I have a dependent, and you know, I have a mortgage, and and we have a cat, and we have bills. You know, I'm I'm a adult. You have a <laughs> it's cat. <a> life. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. but if, if you were like in, doesn't, 18, <laughs> it's yeah. more than what, it's less than what comes out, you know, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. So well, it does end up being like way more than 10% because yeah. you're paying taxes on it. So like if you actually sit down and do the math and I have written a blog post about this, how like how it breaks down, I mean, you're netting negatively every month once you include the income share agreement. And that's just like basic, very small income. Like there's just no way to get ahead. So for 18 payments or not 18 payments, uh, like mine maxes out at $18,000. So once I hit the $18,000, then I'm done paying. But I mean, that could be months. That could be years. You, you never know yeah. how long it's going to take. So for yeah. however long it takes, you're like totally screwed. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Like, I say is for are they unethical? Yeah, probably. Yes, for sure. Um, but it's like the trade off is like if you, that's what you have to do to get a job in tech, because once you're in, it's so good. <laughs> like, I'm sure Al, <laughs> it would be all, it's like it's kind of ridiculous, like how nice we have it. So it's like, it's a trade-off you have to kind of it's hard to, to say like if that's your yeah. only way of doing it you know um but like just getting your foot in the door and getting in because like once you're in you're good like yeah definitely and i mean you're in finance so i'm sure like the hours are completely different for like similar pay <laughs> and whatnot being a developer and and being in finance but um, no, this was really good. And I'm so thankful for all three of you because uh, maybe people would watch this video and think that, oh, you know, Tech Rally went to Flatiron School. So it's just going to be like, I love Flatiron. And this is we're going to talk about how great Flatiron is. Rah, but, rah. Um, I'm just glad that we were able <clears throat> to just get like, more of a realistic perspective and just see both the ups and downs of a, just coding boot camp in general and whatnot. So um, no, this was really good. And maybe um, I'll just close it out with, uh, each one of you just like want to say something and then maybe if they if any of the people in the audience want to reach out and get uh, maybe contact you or whatnot maybe you could like plug a twitter account or i think ej you have a podcast apparently so you could promote nothing that. i would promote on this yeah. that's fine <laughs> yeah let's do it so that's... yeah christian go ahead uh sure yeah i'd say like number one if you're considering doing a coding boot camp um make sure you really like it like i wouldn't recommend trying to do it just for the money, just because you're going to hate it. And more than likely, you're going to fail if you don't love doing it. And if even if you don't, like 10 years down the line, you're just going to be like miserable. So I'd say enjoy like the process. Um, and like if you are in the coding boot camp, um, you should I mean, like every day should be like pretty fun because like you should really like it. Um, yeah. And I guess uh, plugging wise, I don't know. You, you plug uh, plug the Discord. So you can <laughs> Ooh, good one. That's a good code, one. Code link in the, <laughs> we'll put the link in the bio. Link, uh, link in the description. Link in the description. description. <laughs> Click the bell for notifications. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> I got you. I know how YouTube works. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. I, I I promise I wasn't smack talking as much as it sounded like i was um i just can't help myself <clears throat> from being you know sarcastic um alt look i would i would echo a lot of what christian said if you're gonna do it make sure you like doing it i would recommend like looking into the odin project and maybe running through that curriculum real quick because it's free and it pretty much just covers basics to see if you like it at least. And if you like, if you like it, once you go through the fundamentals, definitely research and find any boot camp that really 
uh, makes sense for you. Uh, but also definitely as, as someone who spent like eight, a, a baby's amount of time looking for a job, um, have some sort of plan to, to pay your bills because it really, really hurt at the end. Yeah. Cause I was working like two jobs. One of them was UPS at three in the morning just to like pay bills. And like, I've got a wedding coming up. So we had to like make money to pay for that or what was left of that. Uh, I would, I would say as much as, as much as I said, I would say it was, as, as I said in this whole thing, I would say it was probably worth it for me just because I finally got where I am now right. in the industry, junior role, but still it's in the industry. And then it, from here, it's only going to get better. Plug. Um, the discord. Got it. And our, in our future theoretical, maybe podcast. We don't know. <laughs> Um, so I, I want to preface my experience by saying I cried a lot. If you choose to do a boot camp and you cry a lot, you're very normal. It is programming is like so frustrating, but then it's so great because you get it. So yes, you should enjoy programming, but also if you cry a lot, it's totally fine. <laughs> um, I really think like the best advice I can give anybody is that whether you go to Flatiron, whether like whatever the boot camp is, you get out of it exactly how much you put into it. So if you want to put in two hours a week, you're going to fail. I'm sorry. It's just like the harsh reality. If you put in 12 hours a week, you're going to like go above and beyond. Um, I mean, you could just see the difference between myself, even when I like didn't put in 12 hours a day, when I put like eight hours and I was like, Oh, I'm done. I'm going to go drink. Like you could tell the next day I could tell the next day that I just wasn't where I could have been. So, you know, definitely put in as much time as you possibly can. It's worth it. I think it's worth it. But yeah, if you don't love it, don't force it because you will burn out. Programming is hard. Like, I think that's one of the things that people never talk about is that programming is so hard. It is like mental mind games all day long, like mental exercise. My boyfriend was going to do programming. He he just didn't have the like mental stamina to do it. He was like, I'm too tired for this at the end of like a four hour day of coding. Yeah. And it's just not for that's everybody. That's okay. So cool. Um, and I would plug. love to plug my blog. Ooh. I don't blog a lot, but I try to blog things that are helpful, especially to like new coders. So I've got information about ISAs. I've got an entire blog post on like free resources where you can go to basically like a ton of free boot camps or just free resources on the internet. It's really, really cool. So what's the blog site or it is just a puja dot medium.com. I think I will link it in the description box below. Yeah, <laughs> send it over. Also, you can drink while you code too. So that's, uh, that helps. That's a, that's yeah. awesome. And there is a threshold where you're better at it. It's true. There's like a sweet a spot. drink and a half. Balmer Peak. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Before, oh. before you do the outro, I, I do want to add one thing. Um, doing a boot camp and learning how to code is not um, a competitive sport. For the love of God, mm-hmm. lean on your cohort mates or just like yes. anyone you know. Like community is a real thing and it helps a whole lot. 100% agree on no this No one's one. grading you on your ability to do it by yourself. 100% agree on this one because I think with college or whatever, they tr- they try to compete with each other. I want to be the top 1%, top 2%, top 5%. But yeah, GPA is not real. Like, yeah. Exactly. There's no GPA in learning how to code. Just Exactly. Just exactly. help each other. So. You'll, yeah, you'll, I... you'll get a lot farther. So many questions asked. I used to bug all of my cohort mates and be like, hey, like, how did you do this? Like, how did you get this done or whatever? But then it's really cool because when they do the same to you, then it helps you understand more. So yeah. it's like a give and a take. It's really cool. Yeah. Yep. Well, Christian, EJ, and Alex, thank you so much for this. And for those of you that are still listening, and hopefully <laughs> this was entertaining and informative at the same time, because e. that's actually the vibes I love giving on my channel. Um, <laughs> Ultimately, you know, you got to make a decision on your own and decide what you want to do on your coding journey. But hopefully this was uh, gives you more insight into what it would be like to attend Flatiron School and just coding boot camps in general. 
with that being said uh, this is tech rally and i'll see you in the next episode bye thanks bye bye